Today, more and more people are running their own businesses. But it's a well-known fact that eight out of 10 small businesses fail during the first five years. Why? Because most small businesses are operated for the wrong reasons. In fact, most small businesses aren't businesses at all. They're jobs. That's the viewpoint of Michael Gerber, renowned business consultant and the leading voice on small business and entrepreneurship in America. The founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Gerber Business Development Corporation in Petaluma, California. His company has helped more than 10,000 small businesses dramatically increase their productivity and profitability. Michael Gerber is the author of two best-selling books on small business success, The E-Myth Revisited, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It, and The PowerPoint. Having conducted over 300,000 in-depth analysis of small businesses since 1977, Gerber has a clear view of what ails small businesses. He maintains that most small business owners have no sense of demographics, advertising, cash flow, financing, or management. In fact, they have no understanding of business at all. They don't communicate, nor do they get, nor how to get information. So they just go into denial and eventually under. But, says Gerber, building a successful small business is possible if it's run like a business. This video, Small Business Success, the seven point plan for growing your business, will show you how. In excerpts coming from a live seminar and an interview for public television, Michael Gerber gives you breakthrough insights to make your business really work, starting with the owner. I would say without hesitation that no one who walks into a business of their own, starts their own business, has any idea of what they're getting involved in. Uh, I like to talk about it in my book, In the E-Myth. Uh, I talk about the, uh, the myth of the entrepreneur, that is, that people who go into businesses are not entrepreneurs, rather they're technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. So what we find to be true is that the people who go into business have this extraordinary mindset that they're going to build a business that depends upon them and believe that that's what it's all about. And so they, they go into business with the idea of um, parlaying the, the specific skills that they have, the, me the mechanic and auto repair business, the machinist a machine shop, the, the uh, baker a bakery, et cetera, and so forth. And all they really have is a job. They don't have a business. So I'd like to differentiate between a business and self-employment. 99% of the people I meet in small business are self-employed believing that what they real they own a business because they have a sign and it says this is a business mary shop jack shop but it isn't it's a job and it's the worst job in the world because they're working for a lunatic meaning they now have a new boss and that's why they got into business to get rid of the boss they had to to do their own thing so their prejudice um, if we can call it that is that um they knowing how to do the work can build a business that works. And it's the fatal assumption, because in effect, knowing how to do the work is anything but what's required to build a business that works. Caught in what he calls the tyranny of routine, Gerber observes that most business owners forget their real reason for getting into business in the first place. Business is a waste of time. I mean, nobody's interested in business. I'm not interested in a business. I'm interested in more life. So the true question for a small business owner is, what does more life mean? And it's not owning a business. I mean, I have never met anybody who owns a business who could honestly say that owning a business is more life because they give their life up to it. So my quest is how to create a business that works to give me, my family, the people who work in that business, more life. Well, in order to answer that question, I first have to ask the question, what do I mean by more life? But if you were to begin to ask that question to people who are hard as nails, business people in business, they look at you like you're nuts. Um, more life is surviving. More life isn't being free of this business and not having to come in every day. Wouldn't it be extraordinary if businesses became the instrument in our economy, in our culture, in our country, 
in the world through which people truly began to experience more life rather than what is true of most people in most businesses that the business is a killing field of the spirit the job is not looked upon as something that 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 transforms me or frees me to live a fuller richer more able life the job is something that constrains me it's something i can't wait to get out of it's something i can't wait to leave for the weekend or it's something that he becomes so totally obsessed with that it closes all the light out of my life and I simply become consumed by it. So I'm saying to that person, um, get a life. And a life ain't business. The business can give you more life, but only if you approach it in a much different way. Michael Gerber certainly knows what he's talking about. As a small business owner, he's experienced firsthand the ups and downs of business, including near bankruptcy. With the lessons he's learned, he's been able to put his company's severe financial problems far behind, posting revenues of over $3.1 million and winning a Blue Chip Enterprise Award from the United States Chamber of Commerce. I know that what it requires to build a successful business is two things. And I call that person the pragmatic idealist. Pragmatic because unless it works in the real world, forget about it. And so when I'm speaking about works in the real world over and over and over and over and over again, but unless it's idealistic, reaching for something higher, there's no reason to do it. So the truly extraordinarily entrepreneurial businesses, the, the Disney worlds, the, the FedExes, the, the uh, McDonald's, are businesses that combine this pragmatic idealism. In other words, how to build a business that really works every single time. I mean, when you go to Disney World, it works, it works, it works, it works. Why? Because the systems orientation, the way of thinking about that business is significantly different than the way most small business owners think about their businesses. They see the business, the truly pragmatic idealist, as a whole enterprise apart from the owner, standing alone, doing what it does in such an extraordinary way that people are attracted to it, magnetized to it. I call it a PowerPoint business. That, that, that PowerPoint, the center of that business, is knowing. Knowing how to produce a result consistently that everybody wants, better than anybody else. You can't build a business that does that if it depends upon you to do it. You can't, period. What exactly are the ingredients for success? Is it knowledge, ability, or just plain guts? Michael Gerber has the secret. It's uh, a combination of those. It's a, it's a combination of understanding uh, what a business is, having a clearer picture of what you expect from the business, having a clearer understanding of what it's going to require of you in order to get what you want from that business, um, and engaging in a process, in the process of creating a business, um, of uh, having the kind of help that you would need to learn any craft. This is a, it's a craft. Business and the creation of a business and the operation of a business is a craft. It requires very definite skills, very definite knowledge, very definite information. It requires very definite practice. Um, and without that, and unfortunately, most small business owners we have ever met are deficient in all of those skills, in all of those practices. Uh, essentially are, are doing it by the seat of their pants as opposed to doing it truly well. And the problem is with them is that they don't understand what they're missing. What business owners are missing are 10 critical elements. Gerber calls them the top 10 reasons why small businesses fail. They are lack of management systems, lack of vision and purpose by principles, lack of financial planning and review, over-dependence on specific individuals in the business, poor market segmentation and strategy, failure to establish or communicate company goals, lack of knowledge about the market and the competition, inadequate capitalization or lack of funds, absence of a standardized quality program, and owners concentrating on the technical rather than the strategic work at hand. If you're to start a new business, and you're skilled at a, a particular uh, kind of work, and you have a partner who's skilled at another 
kind of work. And so he or she is a finance person and you are the sales guy. And this is a, a very real scenario that's continuously repeated. Um, the very first thing, if I could catch you before you did that, in other words, if I could catch you in the moment before you had literally made the decision, and if I could get your attention. Now, understand I say if I could. I probably couldn't because to try to talk to somebody who's about to do it and has made up their mind, it's like try to talk to somebody who's about to get married. Um, you know, you say, but you really don't know each other and have you really thought this through? And uh, they want to do it. I mean, there's no stopping them. This is an emotional decision. This is not a rational decision. They're being driven to do this. But if I could stop them, the thing I would stop to do is to begin to ask them questions. I would ask them to begin to ask some very serious questions. And the questions would be questions related to the, the business itself apart from their ability to do the work. I would ask them to pretend and, and, and just imagine for a moment that they, um, two weeks after they start their business, are unable to do the work themselves. That um, the guy can't sell it and the guy can't manage the money. That effectively they're going to be dependent upon this ability, to, this business's ability to operate without them. I would ask them to imagine that and ask them to conceptualize how they would create the business to work without them, totally independent of them. In other words, that they're going to create a business just like you build a house. The house doesn't depend upon you coming in every day. The house is. Well, the business is if you were to approach it in a truly entrepreneurial way. So I would ask them to begin to think about the business as an entity apart from them, an organism apart from them. How is that business going to be grown if you had to hire the people to do the work from day one, the work that you're going to do? You're now going to be the president of a new company. Now understand, it's still a very, very, very small business, but you're now the president, the chief operating officer of that company. What roles are you going to play in the business? You're not partners. You're now operating within the business as employees. You're not operating in the business as owners. You're operating in the business as employees. So I'd begin to get them to understand the difference between being an owner of a business, the shareholder, and being an employee in a business. So I'd get them to begin to understand the different roles that they're really there to play. And in the process of doing that, I would get them to begin to imagine the business as an entity apart from them rather than a part of them. And in the process of doing that, they'd begin to speak about it differently. Just in having that conversation, and I say again, if I could have that conversation, and the truth is most of them don't want to hear it because they can't even conceptualize their business that way because the whole tenant upon which they built this business or are going to build this business is that they know how to do something and wouldn't be great to do it for me rather than for Murray. Um, if I could get them to do that, we're suddenly talking about creating a business. And in the process of talking about creating a business, something apart from me, I suddenly begin to see the business as an invention. I'm an inventor of a business that works. Now we can have a conversation about the invention, meaning the product of their imagination, not the product of their effort, not their sweat, not their, their, their willingness to go do something, but the product of their imagination, the idea of the business. The problem with most small businesses is there's no idea other than the business is a job for me. So if we could do that at the very beginning of that business, everything will change. Business development is crucial. Businesses that don't do it are doomed to fail. As Michael Gerber advises, stop and take a holistic view of your business. Step away from it. Analyze your organization from how it began to where it is now. Then begin to develop a business that works as an independent, integrated system with a purpose, a process, and people business is an idea. That's all it is. The question is, is it a good one or a bad one? And the only way we can know the answer to that question is if we understand what a person wants for himself and his life. And in order to do that, we have to become intimate with that person. 
and intimacy is missing in attorneys, in accountants, in insurance people, in the government, in our lives, period. Intimacy, relationship is what's needed. And it begins and ends with that, with people. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. The only thing I can hope to do today is to share with you a point of view about business, not to effectively uh, change the way you do business, because that's absolutely too much to, to hope for. I mean, the truth is that we could work hand in hand, face to face with people who own and operate their own businesses and have for years. And it takes an extraordinary shift in thinking before anything ever happens with their businesses. And that extraordinary shift in thinking has to take place in one place and only one place. Not in your people, not in the management, not in your customer. Has nothing to do with all the fine words about customer service and excellence and mission statements and all that stuff that everybody gets turned on about and never really makes any difference whatsoever. It has to do with the point of view of the person who owns the business. The problem in American business, the problem in North American business, the problem in all small business has nothing to do, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you, with any of the things that everybody's talking about. And no matter how many seminars you go to, and no matter how many consultants you bring into your business, and no matter how many ideas you get, unless you change your mind about what your business is and what your business is intended to do, nothing whatsoever will work. Never has, never will. It just costs a lot of money and a lot of heartache. The problem in American business, the problem in North American business are the people who own them. The problem is businesses don't work, the people who own them do, and they're doing the wrong kind of work. Now, please don't take anything I say personally here. The light at the end of the tunnel, ladies and gentlemen, is a train coming this way. Hear me. Most businesses don't work, the people who own them do. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It will never change ever until you change the way you think about your business. It doesn't have to be this way. Your problems have nothing to do with your people. Hear me, nothing to do with your people. Your problems have nothing to do with your customer. The problems have nothing to do with the economy. The problems have nothing to do with all of the things that you read about in every damn magazine that talks about business. Nothing to do with every excuse you've ever given. The problems have to do with the way you think. Look at any business, it's in a perfect operating mirror of the person who owns it. If the business is disorganized, it's because you're disorganized. If your people are angry, it's because you're creating that anger. Take responsibility for every single thing that's going wrong in your business and say, there's a sign, there's something I gotta learn. And it never is gonna be sending your managers to learn how to manage better. It's gonna be thinking about your business differently. That's what I wanna share with you today. A point of view that could change your life. You see, without a vision, without a picture, you got nothing to talk about. You got nothing to do. You've got nothing to share. You got nothing to agree about. You got nothing to set people on fire with. Without a vision, without a clear picture, there's absolutely nothing to do in your business but go to work. Hear this, but to go to work. What I call the tyranny of routine. Do when it do when it do another day. Another dollar. You've heard the expressions, thank God it's Friday. In great businesses, it's thank God it's Sunday night because tomorrow we get to go to work. This isn't just rhetoric. This is real stuff. The real stuff of truly entrepreneurial businesses that is absent in small businesses throughout the world because the people who go into business are technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure, and all they know how to do is to go to work, doing it, 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 because they get their own self-gratification and value from the work that they do with their hands, with their mouth, as opposed to with their minds. You understand, the entrepreneur is an inventor of a business that works. There's no difference between an entrepreneurial architect, an entrepreneurial business person, an entrepreneurial physician, an entrepreneurial artist. 
Essentially, the word entrepreneur only means, in a totally different context, a visionary. Someone who creates in their mind a picture of something that doesn't exist right now and then brings it into the world. Yes, that's what I had in mind. They always do. As opposed to the people who simply go to work every day, repeating the past. So I want to share this point of view with you because it is the critical thing that makes the difference in your business. And it's practical. It's pragmatic. This isn't just an idea. It's pragmatic. Everything of any brilliance that happens in the world started as an idea. A business is nothing more than an expression of a thought, an idea. How you think. Change the way you think. Your business changes. It's like that. It's got to. Great businesses are process-oriented process dependent, where every small business in the world is people dependent. The technician creates a people dependent business, the entrepreneur creates a process dependent business. Now let me describe the difference between a people dependent business and a process dependent business in case you might miss the point. And I say in case you might miss the point because the minute I say that every single time there is a knee jerk reaction inside which says they're not as human. And what I'm going to suggest is they're more human than people-dependent businesses ever could be. Because the owner, the founder, the principal, the management, the people, instead of abdicating accountability, truly delegate it. They understand that the system is the solution to creating a business that works. The system always has been and the system always will be. What system? How we do it here. Now, what do I mean by that? How we do it here? How we do what here? How we do everything here? What is it that causes businesses to be successful? They do things in a proprietary way that differentiates them from everybody else. They don't sell things that differentiate them from everybody else. They're not product dependent and they're not people dependent. They are systems dependent. They are process dependent. Two things that exist in great companies that don't exist in all other companies. Intention and attention. Two critical words. Intention and attention. When you're so busy doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, you haven't time to pay attention to the important things. You can't. When you're so busy selling it, making it, shipping it, cleaning it, walking around, doing it, doing it, doing it, you haven't the time to do what needs to be done to create a business that does it extraordinarily well. So what's the message? The message is really very, very simple. I'm going to suggest a way of thinking. I just want you to take a leap of faith for the moment. You don't have to like me. You don't have to think highly of me. I don't have to be your best friend. You can uncross your arms, uncross your legs. You can stop thinking about it. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Because if you, this gets through, something's going to happen in your business. I warn you. I'd like you to imagine that your business is a prototype for 5,000 more just like it. I'd like you to pretend that you're going to create this little prototype and then you're going to be free. You're going to replicate it 5,000. You're going to sell that little sucker 5,000 times with the absolute assurance that every single person who buys it will be able to replicate exactly what you did in exactly the same way every single time. Now that's genius. Just thinking like that separates you from everybody else in business. Because if you were to think like that and begin to do that, you'd have to change the way you go to work every day. Because if your business depends upon you, you couldn't replicate it twice with any assurance that the second one would work. And you know that because you've tried it. Anybody here who's tried that? You're the first salesperson, and you go out and hire an experienced salesperson. Your sales go down the tubes. How come I can't find anybody as good as me? You always say. You're the principal engineer, and you hire somebody to do the engineering. Too much work to do. How come I can't find anybody to do it as good as me? Has anybody ever said that? Would you please raise your hands? Thank you. 
You can't find anybody as good as you. You will never find anybody as good as you. And the point is, you're thinking about the wrong objective. You shouldn't be looking for somebody as good as you, because if they're as good as you, they're going to steal your business. <laughs> That's what you did. <laughs> <clears throat> You should be looking for somebody who is ordinary, because that's what you're going to get anyway. <laughs> and you should prepare for it. Let me tell you how we do it here, every extraordinary business says. Let me tell you, this is our way, every extraordinary business says. And most small businesses can't say it, because they don't have a way. There's just me. So I'm suggesting if you were to think of your business as though it were a prototype for 5,000 more just like it, everything changes. Because then you go to work on it, not in it, to create a system to produce the results. Now let's talk about that process. There are three component parts. Three component parts of this business development process. The first is called innovation. We hear all these words. I just want to give you a little different experience of the word. I'm not talking about innovation of what you sell. That's a never-ending process, too. A one-product company, a two-product company, a ten-product company, doesn't make any difference. Anybody, everybody is going to knock off your product. You know it's absolutely inevitable. A product will never differentiate your business. Ever. Never. It's not the thing you sell that makes the difference. That's an absolutely necessary component of your business, but it's not what differentiates you. It's not the good product that makes the difference. Because if the good product made the difference, ladies and gentlemen, most successful businesses would be out of business today. Innovation. And all the innovations are always small. And they have nothing to do with all the innovation everybody's talking about. You know, mission, state, none of, none of that stuff. Little things. All the little things that your business is made of. How you answer the phone. Little things. Innovation. Quantification is the second component part of this business development process. How well did it work? Innovation, quantification, orchestration. And orchestration is the elimination of discretion. That is choice at the operating level of your business. Now hear me, the elimination of choice at the operating level of your business. And you say, yeah, but that's like a prison. And I'm saying, only if it's a bureaucracy. And you never, and you stop changing. But if people are making a choice about how they sell, how they answer the phone, how they do this or how they do that in your business, ladies and gentlemen, they are absolutely doing the exact opposite, the inimical, the antithesis of what you really need them to do in your business. What you're looking for is certainty. So that every time the customer comes back, they experience identically the same thing. If it works. Because what the hell good does it do to do something that touches the customer in the absolutely correct and positive way one time and to do exactly the opposite the next? That's why people don't come back. They never know what to expect. And that's why franchises are so successful. Because they built a model that works and they replicate it and replicate it faithfully over and over and over again and continually, continually go to work in the model to continually create a better result. There's four key systems in the systems hierarchy of any business. The first is how we do it here. How we do it here. How we do what? Just what I said, everything. How we do research here. How we plan here. How we hire here, how we, how we do everything, how we do it here, everything we do. The entrepreneurial personality goes to work on the business to find a better way, 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 and to put it into the can. And to make certain that everybody knows it. The second component system in this hierarchy of systems is how we recruit, hire, and train people to do it here. The third system is how we manage here. Yes, a management system. You ask most managers how they manage, they well, I manage. <laughs> I manage. I mean, it's pretty difficult to manage around here, but I manage. I get by. I'm a people person. I can look into his eye. <laughs> I can know when he's lying, when he's not. 
I had psychology in school. <laughs> I've been around this business for a long time. Nobody can get by me. I manage. What do you do? I do what I do. <laughs> he ain't going to tell you because he don't know what he does. He couldn't explain it in a million years. I know that's not true of anybody in the room. But it's true of everybody I meet out there. There ain't no management system. This is how we manage here. That's what they do at McDonald's. You think they hire professional managers from Harvard to come and manage those money machines? God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> they grow those people from the inside out. They teach them their system. They teach them everything they need to know to become better and better and better and better at what we do here. And finally, the thing that keeps this thing from being dead is how we change it here. And we need a system for changing it, changing it, changing it, changing it, and it never ends. So how we do it here today may be different tomorrow, but how we do it here tomorrow is exactly how everyone will do it here tomorrow. And how we do it here the next day is how everyone will do it the next day. And tomorrow may be three years from now, or tomorrow may be 10 years from now, but effectively, the change is absolutely certain because everything else is changing. And we're constantly in competition, not with the world, but ourselves. Imagine now that you're gonna take this business of yours and do this mind game. See, it's just in your mind. Change the way a person thinks and everything will follow. Don't change what they do, change how they think. First. First step in a business development program has nothing to do with your business. It's what I call the, the, the visualization of your own personal primary aim. Your primary aim, your personal objective, whatever words you use for it. It all means the same thing. It's what do you want for your life? Now hear me, I mean, what do you want for, because if you don't know what you want for your life, then what, how in the world are you gonna get your business to do it for you? See, I'm suggesting your business is only a means to an end. I'm saying business is really a boring, boring waste of time. I'm saying the only value of owning a business as opposed to having a job is that the business is supposed to do something more for you than the job could. What? Well, first you've got to answer that question by saying, this is what I want for my life. I want you to imagine this. Just get this picture. Imagine a room, and it's softly lit, full of people seated quietly looking toward the front of the room. Drapes on the walls, muted, quiet. Obviously, something very important is happening. In front of the room is a dais, much like this one, a little larger. On the dais is a table. Two ends of the table are candles, lit, shining brightly. Between the candles is a box. In the box is you. Stiff as a board. <laughs> this is what I call COD. It's your crap out date. <laughs> now please, if you haven't heard a word I've said, understand we all got one. <laughs> I mean, do you know we're gonna be in the box? The question is, what do we do between now and then? It's always been the question, but we stop asking it after a while, and we simply live as though we're immortal. The light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming this way. There is an end to this. Now, I want you to imagine, suddenly, you see all the faces in that room, and from the four corners of the room comes a voice, and it's your voice. And you're obviously not talking. <laughs> it's a tape recording. And you're addressing people at your COD and telling them what you did with your life, the story of your life. What would you like to say? 
I mean, if you truly were to sit down right now and envision your COD and that tape, what would you like to say on that tape to those people? These are the things that I did. This is the mountain I climbed. These are the rivers I forged. These are the people I touched. This is the difference I made. This is the joy that I experienced. This is what I'd like to pass on to everybody in this room before it's too late for you. That story, that script for that tape is what I call your primary aim. And essentially I'm saying, if you were to sit down right now, if your managers were to sit down right now, if your wife, if your husband, if your children were to sit down right now and go through the exercise of truly creating that script, ladies and gentlemen, something would change. And without knowing what that is, you can't do the next thing, which is the second step in a business development program, which is your strategic objective, the picture of a business that's going to give you more life. What does your business have to look like when it's finally done? I'm saying when it's done, when it's finished, when you can say, did it, in order to give you that life that we're talking about. How big will it be? It's going to be a $50 million company. It's going to be a $5 million company. It's going to be a $2 million company, a $1 million company, a half a million dollar company. <clears throat> what are the gross profits going to be? What are the net pre-tax profits going to be? What are the net after-tax profits going to be? Who is going to be your central demographic model? Who are you going to be selling to? What are you going to be selling to? How are you going to be doing that that's going to differentiate you from everybody else? What's your business going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to act like? What are you going to people going to be dressed like? Picture it. Where is it going to be? Is it going to be just here in Vancouver? Is it going to be regional? Is it going to be national? Is it going to be international? I'm saying you need to answer those questions before you even start your business. Because if you don't have a picture of what it's going to look like when you're finally done, how the hell will you ever know when you get there? The third thing you need to do in a business development program is called organizational development. And I mean by organizational development, creating an organization chart. Now, I say to people who own and operate a small business, they've got to create an organization chart, and they look at me like I'm absolutely out of my mind. An organization chart? Who needs a chart? I do this, he does that. Who needs boxes? I mean, give me a break. I'm suggesting one of the most powerful things you can do in your business is to begin to think about it functionally rather than personally. Functionally rather than personally. Begin to think about your business as functionally rather than personally. Every business in this room has three essential functions, and everybody knows it. Marketing, operations, and finance. You've got to sell it, you've got to deliver it, and you've got to manage the money. But those are functions, those aren't people. Reporting to marketing is the sales manager and the advertising research manager. Reporting to operations is whatever and whatever. Reporting to finance is whatever and whatever. And reporting to the president, the chief operating officer are those three senior positions, those three essential functions. So you can see this chart, and it always goes like that. So to take this organization chart, now all your partners and everybody else in the room, and just start putting names in the boxes. Right? So who's the president? Uh-oh. <laughs> Got a problem already. <laughs> the partners begin to look at each other. Every one of them knows me. <laughs> you know. But we don't really want to say that. We, we share the presidency, people say. Who you knows shared presidency is, right? It's a lunatic asylum. How <laughs> I many things we do to ourselves in our business is absolutely insane. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on, but nobody wants to talk about it. Somebody's got to be the president. So put the names in the boxes. Who's the president? Who's the vice president of marketing? Who fills the spot of vice president of operations? And who fills the position called vice president of finance? You begin to put your names in the boxes. Guess what? In some businesses in this room, you're in every box. Anybody do that? Anybody go through the exercise? Anybody here have to sell anything today? I'm literally going to have to go back. What are you when you're selling something? Right in the bottom of the chart. You hear me? And you give them the chart. Owner, right? President. No, you're not. Salesperson. Anybody have, here have to make something in your business? Right. What position are you filling? See, if you begin to think about this functionally, you begin to see all the work you're doing on that chart. 
And understand the purpose of the chart. It's to get out of those boxes. The point of being in your business is to get out of those boxes, not stay there. The mistake we make is we want to get out of the box and replace ourselves with a person with experience. Has anybody done that? That's called abdicating accountability, not delegating it. We hire somebody, get the hell out of the box. Free until they screw up, which is right now. And you're back in the box again. Out of the box, in the box, out of the box, in the box, out of the box, in the box. That's what every owner of every small business is doing. Doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, and never trusting anybody to get it done. Why? Because you can't. Because you did it wrong. So let's do that all over again. You leave a system in the box. If you're going to be in the box, you go to work in the box and on it at the same time. You go in the box of salesperson and on it as sales manager. You create a system selling process. This is how we sell it here. And then you hire a person who doesn't know their elbow from you know what, and you teach them the system. And then they do it, and you watch them. And as they run into obstacles because of their limitations, not yours, you change the system to fit them and change it, and change it, and change it until it's working. Got it. And now you created a little turnkey, and you replicate it. And the whole 80-20 rule about selling changes immediately. That whole 80% of our sales come from 20% of our people, that is self-inflicted pain, because you're people-dependent, not process-dependent. The system is a solution. And you go on to the next box, and the next box, and the next box, and the next box, and you're out of it. And that's where you ought to be, is out of it. Because when you're out of it, you can look at it, and you can see it whole. Wouldn't you love to be out of your life? Has anybody ever had that out of, in quotes, body experience, where you've suddenly seen yourself as you are? Has anybody ever done that? You know, those fleeting, painful moments, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Of crystal clarity. You see all of the stupidity and all of the genius and all of the sins of commission and all of the sins of omission. Ah, Ganesh once said, it isn't the sins of commission that kill us, it's the sins of omission. It ain't the things we do in our life that's the problem, it's the things we didn't do. And the guilt and the pain because of it. We'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, and we never do. Fourth step is management development. By management development and the creation of a management system. Let me give you a little story. I was driving from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and typically I drive straight through, but I got tired for some reason. I wanted to stay over, and I hadn't made reservations, and I saw a hotel, and I stopped. And as luck would have it, they had a room. They whisked me to the room. And this room was absolutely exquisite. <coughs> the ceiling's 14 feet high, natural cedar walls. Skylight opened the sound of the surf and the Pacific Ocean birds and crabs and whatever the hell else was out there. Beautiful original graphics in the walls, a bed with a white spread, not a wrinkle in it. Four poster white pine at the foot of the bed, this huge fieldstone fireplace, oak logs in it, paper crumpled underneath, designer's match waiting to be struck in the heart. The place was exquisite. I couldn't believe it. It was like a movie set. I get changed. I get hungry. I get ready for dinner. And I was told that how to get there. And you walk out the door of the, the room and into a redwood grove. Down a lovely lit path. I could hear the deer settling down for the night. <laughs> the quail fluttering, doing whatever the hell they do. <laughs> I walk up to a knoll, and on the knoll is the restaurant overlooking the entire Pacific Ocean. Stars out. I mean, the place is extraordinary. And packed with people. I say to myself, well, I'll wait. Oh, well, I was hungry. I go to the maitre d'. I give him my name. He says, oh, Mr. Gerber, we've been expecting you. 
and immediately takes me to my table. Beautiful waitress comes to the table dressed in a lovely little uniform with a little rosette on her breast, the logo of the hotel. Brings me the most extraordinary dinner. I have a couple of bottles of wine. There's a fire in the fireplace. There's a guitarist in the corner playing Bach fugues. I'm having the most incredible evening. I go back to my room. I open the door and there's a fire in my fireplace. And the quilts roll down on the bed and tied in two neat little bows at the foot of the bed. The pillows are plumped up in two little mitts. A glass of brandy on the night table. <laughs> and a little card. And the card says, and I paraphrase, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming here this evening. If there's anything anything at all I can do for you, day or night, please don't hesitate to call. Kathy. I immediately have a thought and immediately suppress it. <laughs> <laughs> Decide not to push my luck and go to sleep. <laughs> I wake up in the morning, there's a gurgling in the bathroom. First thought in my perverted mind, Kathy. <laughs> I go to the bathroom. There's nobody there, but there's a coffee pot, an automatic perk bubbling away in a little card that says your brand of coffee. And it was. How'd they know that? And I remember the night before in the restaurant, they asked me, what brand of coffee do you prefer? And here it was. The minute I get that one, there's a knock at the door. Kathy! <laughs> I go to the door. There's nobody there, but there's a newspaper on the mat. The New York Times. My newspaper. How did they know that? And I remember the night before when I checked in, they asked me, what newspaper do you read? And there it was. Now hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Every single time I have gone back to that hotel ever since, exactly the same thing has happened. But never, ever, ever again did they ask for my preferences. They already knew what they were, and they immediately were forthcoming. And added to every time I returned, the room, the fruit, the wine, the brandy. What did they give me? They give me a match, a mint, a cup of coffee, and a newspaper. And for the privilege, I pay them $342 a night. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, I'm in charge. I have a fantasy, I make the call, and I realize it. They always keep it true. That's a management system. How many hotels do you know of where that's going to happen to you? And it is so easy to do. If anybody would have the intention and the attention necessary to create the system to make sure that it happens. And that's what management is all about, making that promise come true. It's so simple. The next is people development. Okay, I got a management system. How do I get my people to do it? Let me tell you something. You can't get your people to do anything. You've already tried. You got to create a place in which they want to do it. You got to create a game people want to play. Most businesses don't even know what I'm talking about. You got to create a game people want to play. You need a people development system, a recruiting, hiring, training system, a management system. You need to have a story to tell about your business. I want you to imagine this recruitment. You're hiring someone to work in your store, or to make hot dogs, or to clean the floor. The most menial of jobs, the simplest of jobs. Here's how a great business does it. A friend of mine's son got a summer job at Disneyland. And they wait down there in line to get their turn. <laughs> He gets the summer job in Disneyland, and he becomes a host. That's a very fancy name for the guy who takes the ticket. You know what I'm talking about? The kid gets the job, goes to work on Monday. My friend is sitting having a drink Monday night. The kid comes home. He says, how did it go today, son? He said, fine, Dad. I'm in training. Good going, son. Nothing can go wrong. He's at Disneyland, you know. Second day, Tuesday, kid comes home. My friend's having a drink. He drinks a lot owns a business. <laughs> 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 
How'd it go, son? Great, Dad, I'm in training. Friend doesn't say anything, but he's a little nerve looked out. <laughs> Third day, kid comes home. How'd it go today, son? Great, Dad, I'm in training. Son, can I ask you a question? You got a problem learning what they're trying to teach you? <laughs> I mean, I understand you're taking tickets, right? What's so hard about that? <laughs> the kid looks at his father with stunned, surprised. Dad, this is Disney. This is the park. We haven't even gotten to the job yet. <laughs> We're still talking about the old man. And the best I can figure it out, I get to the part about taking the tickets on the end of Friday. And I think it goes something like this. <laughs> A week. It ain't what we do, it's where you are that matters. This is a religion. We got a ritual. This is the Catholic Church. This is the sanctity of the vision. How many of you have ever told a story about your business that they would tell at Disneyland? Let me tell you about Walt. All the stories about Walt. Who the hell tells stories about you? Everybody, but you don't want to hear them. <laughs> and you say, yeah, because I ain't Walt. And I'm saying, no, because you didn't think like Walt. If you would dare right now to sit down and tell a story about the business you're there to create, and then hold a hiring seminar for 97 of these prospective clerks, only one of whom's going to get the job, and you walk in and the lights are on and you say, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our show. We're here to talk about a very special business and a very sp special opportunity. I wish all of you could experience it. Unfortunately, you can't. And that's what we're here to find out. And in fact, I'm not going to waste a lot of your time and I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'm going to do all the talking. I want to tell you the story about our business, why it was created, how it works, and why, if you're selected, it's going to be the most extraordinary experience in your life. Anybody want to hear that story? You bet your ass. Now, to hear this, everybody is skeptical. But we'll overcome that in time. Why? Because it's a true story. Because we actually do these things. We create a business in which people grow. We don't expect that clerk to stay here for the rest of his life. We say, ladies and gentlemen, this is McDonald's. We have a 300% annual personnel turnover in a year, and that's the position you're taking. And we know that's why you're taking it. You're only here for a little while. We want to make your stay as profitable to you as it will be to us. And let me tell you how we intend to do that. Not unrealistic expectations, the truth. We play a game here. It's called be better than we've ever been before. And what we hope is going to happen is when you leave here on your journey in your life, you're still talking to this clerk, understand? That when you leave here, you got something more than what you walked in with. And that's my gift to you. Your gift to me is to play the game as hard as you can. Let me tell you what it's all about. People development. The sixth step in a business development program is marketing development. And I'm just going to shortly say the two key words in marketing, demographics and psychographics. Demographics and psychographics. It's who buys and why they buy. It's who buys and why they buy. And if you don't know who the central demographic model of your business is, you can't even begin to do it. And if you don't know the central demographic model of your business, you can't even begin to understand why they, to how to sell them. It all ends up being in luck. And finally, the last step, or the seventh step of the business development program is systems development. And the three kinds of systems, soft systems, hard systems, and information systems. Soft systems are all these words I'm talking about. It's the scripting your salespeople use. It's the scripting that people use in the telephone. Scripting, 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 scripting. It's scripting everything you do in your business. It's the words in your, 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 the letter that greets your new employee. It's this, it's all the soft systems that make up your business. It's the documentation of everything that you do. 
documentation of everything you do. If it ain't written down, you don't own it. If it ain't written down, you don't own it. If it ain't written down, you don't own it, even though you think you do. If you can't show me it, it doesn't exist, no matter how hard you try. And that's not to prove it to me. It just tells you it doesn't exist. And if it isn't there written down, you're operating on luck. Hard systems, all the visualization of your business. One of the most powerful things you could do is grow, go back and have a designer draw the finished business in your mind. Draw it, paint it, put up the picture. How does it look when it's done? The vision. Your truck, your cars, the floors, the walls, the ceilings, all have been designed. This is an extraordinary place. You go to Federal Express, that's what's happening there. You go to Disneyland, that's what's happening there. In the back and in the front, where they pick up their uniforms and upstairs. You understand, it's not just for the audience, it's for everyone there. Everybody's your audience. You want to bring your banker and let me show you this little sucker, you will believe your eyes. You bring your suppliers and let me show you what we do. Look at the thing. Look at the thing. How do you keep your floor so clean? At Disneyland, they steam clean the park every night. Steam clean the park every night. And information systems. It tells you how well all those things are working. And that's a business development program. And that's building a franchise prototype. And that's all I really have to tell you. To go to work on your business and to create a business that works. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Bye -bye. <laughs>